Thank you for joining us tonight to this um, webinar number four in our series of uh, Tataya webinars, um, which celebrates Restoration Week 2023. Um, I'm going to now bring across, uh, so we can see them slightly better, uh, our first presenters. There we are. And Stu on the left that you can see, I hope it's your left uh, or some of your right, it might be. Yeah, there he is. Stu's actually in Auckland. What are you doing up there, Stu? I'm at the uh, National Stormwater Conference, actually. And the great thing is you said you'd still present for us, which you're going to do very shortly. And then to your right or left, depending on where she fits into the screen, um, is uh, Alona Keenan, who many will know. Alona, can you please give us a bit of an update of what you, uh, where you fit in and what you're doing at the moment? Sure. Um, ko marie koutou. Uh, welcome to our, um, our webinar series. Um, I'm in the Urban Ecology team for Wellington City Council um, and I am the pest plant spe specialist, which I think is really hilarious, given the amazing um, people that are speaking tonight. Um, I really stick to my bread and butter about killing the worst weeds in the most precious places in, across Wellington City. But these guys just do such incredible, really innovative work, which is why we want them um, presenting to you guys tonight. Um, there's so many weeds. Uh, you can find out lots of information from Weed Busters. If you want to actually make Weed Busters better, you can email me because we're um, nationally we're working on a better pro um, website there. And um, uh, and I think that's that's enough. Um, get, in, get in contact with either your city council, your rangers or, or myself if you want to know more about weeds and um, yeah, enjoy tonight's um, call it all. Lovely and finally before you go what's your, um, what do you want to say to all the volunteers around Wellington that do such a great job in all these spaces um, you, you deal with a lot of them anything you want to say to them while some of them are watching this? Yeah, I am constantly amazed by your mahi, um, you are really really inspirational um, if you need more help, please ask, because the only way we get more help is to show the need. Um, and, yeah, thank you so much. Nā mihi nui, koutou. Hello, thanks very much. It's lovely to have had you introducing the next guests. And uh, you can head off now and watch in the green room. Very nice indeed. Thank you. And she's away. Stu, hello. Welcome from Auckland. The rest of us are in Wellington, but you're from Auckland. Um, we have a presentation. Would you like to, while I'm putting your presentation on, just tell us exactly who you are and uh, a wee bit of your background. Oh, he's zipped away. He'll come back, I think. So here we go. I'll bring you in, Joachim, and I'm going to put your presentation up there, um, and then you'll be able to talk to us. All right, exciting. Um, thanks to everyone for actually, you know, tuning in here and listening to what I have to say tonight. And, you know, thanks for um, Nick as well, hosting and all that jazz. Very, all very exciting. So, uh, yeah, my name is Joachim. I'm the coordinator of Temotu Kaerangi Miramar, uh, Miramar Ecological Restoration. That's a long name. Uh, and we do basically uh, a lot of different uh, work out here on the Miramar Peninsula. So basically we do everything from uh, weeding during summertime to planting during, um, uh, sorry, planting during um, winter. But then we also try to engage the community with quite a wide range of different things here. And one thing that we actually do here uh, when we talk about weeding and community work is we're actually uh, looking a bit more to not just, you know, parks and reserves or road reserves, but actually people's backyards, because a lot of the problems are actually coming from the backyards as well. So my little short, uh, story presentation tonight is basically uh, how we kind of engage property owners uh, on the peninsula here and what we can kind of all do together uh, to remove uh, the invasive weeds that people might actually be harboring in their backyards because uh, a lot of like knowledge about these plants isn't that uh, you know widely known uh, for the wider community in a way so that's one of the things we actually do here as well. So can you see my slide there as well? Quite right. Um, yep. Your backyards to native gardens. Uh, so for example, if you're actually looking at this picture here, you see uh, Kahili ginger. Uh, it's actually one of our kind of more um, bad weeds, invasive introduced weeds that we actually have around the place. Uh, if you're looking again around the peninsula here, we don't actually tend to see many at all 
in the reserves we have here. Uh, for example, in Centennial Reserve, we've actually removed all the Kahili ginger, uh, as far as we're aware. But then it's still clinging on to a few backyards and gardens and things like that. So we just try to engage those property owners and just like, you know, kind of raise the awareness with them of how we can deal with these guys and the problems they possess, basically. So jumping over to my next slide here. So a bit of background with basically uh, weeds and things like that. So the numbers of possibly introduced species of plants in New Zealand is possibly even up to 35,000. About 800 or so of these um, species of plants are quite serious invasive weeds that are actually impacting our native biodiversity in way one way or another. Uh, you know, everything from you know, removing habitat for some species or, um, you know, uh, stopping seeds to generate on the ground or even, you know, affecting waterways and things like that. And a lot of these species of, of weeds, uh, they came here, of course, because of the horticultural, you know, purposes, you know, and to be in gardens. So basically, still on average, every year, about eight garden species actually jumps the fence and kind of starts becoming more and more established uh, in the wild. Uh, and this picture you can see here is a bit of a morning glory. Um, as far as we can recall, there was only basically one patch of morning glory on the peninsula in early uh, 2010 that was down in Sichun. This is now spread all the way up to uh, Karaka Bay as well. So they're being a wind dispersed species, they you know disperse quite far away. Uh, and many of these are also spreading just because of the lack of knowledge what how these guys actually behave. Um, but also, for example, with uh, you know, you have a garden, you do a bit of trimming and maintenance, and then basically you have a darker corner somewhere in the corner of your backyard, or you just dump it over the fence. And that's one way of these uh, plants to actually disperse as well into the wider area. Um, so, of course, that suddenly means that volunteers like us as well have to kind of do a bit of a cleanup work as well and try to kind of stop these people from doing that or just engaging again with the owners where we think these plants might be coming from. So you can see here, this is a picture on your left side. That's actually somebody's garden dump site at Karaka Bay. Uh, top right hand side corner is down on the coast. Uh, and then, of course, near the prison, somebody's actually been dumping cuttings and clippings of agapanthus flowers and seed heads that have even done a bit of, um, you know, rubbish dumping there as well, having a black rubbish bin. And some of these plants are having not just an effect in terms of, you know, um, you know, spreading, causing problems as well. Uh, George Paris yesterday at Predator Free talked about Cape Ivy and that's how that's a big problem. And this is something that I would actually like to address a bit more as well. Cape ivy uh, is uh, an introduced species uh, to New Zealand. It came here as a hedging plant. You can see it still as a hedging plant in, in places of the Mediterranean and places like Turkey. Uh, here they have uh, quite a big tendency of, as they grow, they keep growing on top of themselves the whole time, becoming taller and heavier. And especially around the peninsula here where we have a lot of uh, road sites and banks and things like that, they actually cause quite a lot of uh, landslips as well as they climb up into the canopy, kill off the trees basically, and then the whole thing collapses down. Uh, and as Josh said yesterday as well, where we have Cape by, we, we pretty much always have rats as well. So, you know, just by removing the weeds, you will actually help remove the, the you know, the introduce mammalian predators as well, like rats, you know, and hedgehogs and things like that, that will be hanging around these things uh, because they provide dark, dry, nice understory and easy to kind of burrow through as well as the plant keeps growing on top of themselves. So we kind of engage um, the community with kind of different methods. Uh, one of the things you can see on the left side here is just a bit of a cutout from our uh, what we call the good neighborhood guide uh, that we've produced and we actually give out to the community here and they can pick it up in places like cafes or the library or during event days or planting days and things like that and that just gives you a bit of an idea of you know everything that kind of goes around on the peninsula 
Uh, we also have our website, which is actually aiming for gardeners and what they can do to make their uh, backyards more wildlife friendly. And of course, um, you know, learn a bit more about the weeds as well. Uh, and then down at the right hand side corner, you will see a poster that we've also made that people can take home and, you know, put up in the kitchen or something like that. Um, but just not about that. We actually do, uh, as a volunteer group, we actually do uh, backyard visits as well. Uh, completely free for the people living around the peninsula here and we basically go there we uh, point out the different kind of weeds and I'm not talking about weeds like dandelions or anything like that we're looking at more at those kind of weeds that are having an environmental impact because we kind of think that backyards will be the future uh, space of conservation as well as you know urban environments are spreading uh, so we're basically doing a backyard visit uh, to raise awareness and how people can actually be a part of Te Motukarang in Miramar ecological restoration from their backyard. Um, and with pointing out the weeds and how to control them, uh, we also give advice on what to plant in its place as well, you know, or even what kind of natives they already have, because again, there, the, the knowledge isn't always that great. So pointing out the weeds they have that they should remove, the natives that they might have and need to look after, and even if they have space, we do recommend, you know, uh, what they could plant in that spot as well. And some U.S. studies have actually shown that if you include at least 25% of native plants in a garden, you can actually make a contribution towards conservation and native biodiversity. So that's quite important, actually. So to give these guys a bit of an idea as well of, you know, what it could look like, we take a few pictures uh, and then basically do a bit of a Photoshop collage basically of what things could look like and if they have a certain requirement or something and this kind of comes into a little bit of landscaping but we still promote that people use eco-source material uh, and also you know different methods to remove a certain species of uh, hardy weeds so you can see at the top right hand side corner there we've actually the property owner have actually put a black uh, tarp to basically suffocate some of the succulents that they actually had growing there and then we've suggested that with this place being a bit of a um, south facing side, quite shady, but damp, that they could actually have certain species of ferns and things like that. I'm just taking my time here as well, so I'm not talking too long because I can talk about it all night. Um, so basically one of these property owners that lives down the road from my place here was Eric and Komiko as well. And they were recently moving into New Zealand from overseas. They had no idea about, you know, the problems of some of these weeds. So they invited us to come on over and we pointed out, for example, Agapanthus. And what they did off that was quite amazing. They actually started removing it from the property and they removed six ton Agapanthus. And then after that was gone, started replacing it with natives, uh, some of them being Ringa Ringa and Flaxes and Ekaus to kind of stabilize the bank that uh, the Agapanthus was growing on. But they've also increased, um, included other species like pigeon wood as well, because the Kiriru is quite uh, a bird that hangs around their property as well. Uh, they're still battling morning glory, which is now coming in from next door as well. So kind of had to engage with the property owners there. And because we've kind of Pulled them up a little bit about weeds and things like that. They recently also found South African club moss on the property. And um, this is all a species of weed that we don't actually have in a lot of places around here. So it's really important that we actually deal with these uh, weeds before they actually establish this too much and becomes a problem we can't deal with, basically. And we're jumping over again. So here's a few kind of concept art works we've done as well for people. Um, down in the Miramar sports field next to it, uh, what people could do to kind of block a bit of the noise and the disturbance from the sports field just into um, the property itself. And you can see down is a picture of uh, from Miramar North School actually, we established a lizard garden and removed all the weeds and bushes, non-native bushes sitting there. Um, and we promote that people use eco-sourcing as well. And this is to prevent, uh, you know, other species that are not native to Wellington. And I can even talk about like non-native, uh, sorry, non-local native weeds as well, such as, you know, Putikawa and Karaka and Karo as well. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're quite strict on the species we're actually planting back. Uh, otherwise, we're technically just gardening rather than actually doing restoration work. And future conservation, uh, 
by basically including the community doing restoration jobs in their backyards. Uh, we reckon the backyard can be an important part to play for many species and help species recover, especially if we're looking at plant species. Uh, as urban environments are spreading, we see developments all over the place. I mean, Shelly Bay is probably going to, you know, become massive buildings, maybe up by the Miramar prison as well. Uh, you know, so a lot of future conservation sites might actually be in backyards, you know, uh, and they by connecting all of these gardens as well, uh, we can create these green networks uh, and green areas to act as corridors be between those remnant bush fragments that we have, you know, here and the rest of Wellington as well, to allow some species, you know, of invertebrates and lizards to actually more freely be able to move between places. Uh, but from a people point of view as well, I mean, nature gardens, they will act as an education tool. People learn about the species they're growing as well, raising conservation awareness that is really important for both adults and kids. Uh, and of course, when we have things like, you know, um, bioblitness and, you know, the nature city challenge that happened the other week, you know, people can just go out in their own backyard and basically learn a bit more of, you know, the species they have around them as well. And you can see Anna, who's one of our volunteers here, she's planting Matagauri, uh, which is really exciting as well. It's a good technique to work with that there. Uh, and the last slide I have is basically one of our projects. I see one of my pictures is missing there, but one of the projects we're just going to work with now is removing um some of these uh, species of um there's a bit of lavender there and geraniums there is a bit of cotony at this loca locality as well but that will be replaced by natives and this is down at the sea tune bowling club as well so they want to remove all exotics and basically replace it with natives which is going to become almost like a green um island of natives in this otherwise quite urban environment and if you look at a top little picture on the right hand side corner up there that's actually my backyard i've actually allowed people to come and have a look at the work we do here as well uh when i moved into this place uh six years ago this was an english garden there was roses and there was ivy uh manolia and things like that and that's all gone now and now we basically have native ferns coming through um pate um kofis and a wide range of other stuff and now we like being pretty much soon to be rat free as well we already see an amazing amount of skinks and geckos hanging around our place so in that tiny picture plus a little bit around us on a um spotting of a um sorry um spotlighting at night time like just the other night we had seven geckos just in this vicinity of that garden so it's really exciting and just seeing what a native you know, removing these weeds and replacing them with natives can actually do for biodiversity. So that's about what I want to do, kind of touch on a little bit today. If anyone has any more questions or anything like that, just feel free to bring that through. But yeah. Thanks, thanks Joachim. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for jumping in a wee bit early too. And what I've managed to do is get Stu back. So I'm going to put you in the green room and I can come back to you with any questions at the end, if you don't mind just hanging a little bit longer. Stu, I'm, it's great to have you back. I'm sorry about that, but we lost your link, but you're back now. So let's put your presentation up. I know you've got to get to a conference and I can click the slides if you can see them and take us through it. Okay. Cheers, Nick. Yeah, it turns out that when somebody rings you and you're on a webinar on your phone and you press decline, it cuts off the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we learned. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, kia ora all. Um, yeah, firstly, I'll just say that, uh, that I'm, a, I'm an avid garden, gardener um, and also an ecological engineer. So I bring a couple of different veins to it. Um, and, a, and a pretty keen gorilla conservationist. Um, so my little project that I'm just going to um, run through um, tonight is, is in a side tributary of the, of the Waipapa Awa, which is on the east side of um, Mount Victoria, um, and just on Ruahini Street behind the Badminton Hall. If you go to the next slide, um, Nick, it's a very, very small reach of stream, which, which, um, which only flows in the middle of winter, um, around about two hectares of catchment, and then it goes in, into the pipes, which come all the way up down into the marina. So there's no catchment below and there's uh, very little catchment above. But if we go on to the next slide. Next slide. Um, at the bottom of it, there's a small pool which is permanently there throughout the year. Um, and it turns out that within that pool is a thriving population of banded kokapoo. So that pool's about two square metres in area and I've counted up to 20 banded kokapoo of, of all sizes. Um, and so it was the, the I was, I was been trapping in there for a long time, 
and it was the observation of those kokapu that forced me to think well hey i'm gonna i'm gonna start uh, doing some restoration in here but if you go to the next slide the uh the entire catchment was covered uh, very densely with uh with tradescantia that i'm sure everyone is very familiar with here um, as well as a lot of uh, climbing asparagus and english ivy um, so i committed to, to to clean up this two hectare catchment um, at the very start of the COVID lockdown. So started on, on day one of the COVID lockdown. Um, uh, I guess we weren't actually supposed to be doing volunteer work during that time, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I committed to put in an hour a day over lockdown. Um, and so it's been three years now. And if you flick to the next slide, it's in the same location. Wow. Um, this, is the, this, is, this is the same location now, three years later. So I'm just going to talk through a little bit about the, the method that I deploy. It's a, it's a, it's a labor of love method, I think you could say. So if you jump onto the next slide. Um, and I'm going to have to just, excuse me, I'm going to zoom in here. So as I said, there's, uh, there's three main weeds right throughout, Tradescantia, Asparagus, Fed and English Ivy. There's also quite a lot of um, Cara, Caraca and Northern Lacebark, which I've also, also been controlling. Um, and I've been doing this, this is a bit of a solo project. Originally did it with my two kids, but uh, on day one, my daughter put the wheelbarrow into a wasp's nest and got chased out in many, many stings. So that put a kibosh on that. And uh, I've done a lot, of, a lot of restoration work with groups in the past, um, but this has sort of been a bit of a, a bit of a, a solo mission which has been quite interesting from a sort of a, a sort of a mindfulness perspective so really re restoring the forest and the intermittent and ephemeral stream um, and really avoiding chemicals wherever possible i have had some great support from city council with um with some of the asparagus fern and some of the harder to get to spots um trying to work with the lunar phases so so really trying to understand what the plants are doing at different phases of the moon and um and work with that and so therefore timing is critical and part of that is is both the, the time of the year and, the, and what the moon's up to, but also really understanding what the soil moisture is and, and how that affects um, how we how we uh, how we deal with the weeds. And for the for the tradescantia, which has been the main thing, um, really huge areas completely infested with tradescantia that I think are pretty close to 100% success right now, um, is really using the old roll and rake method. Um, but I but I adopt a, a, a two to three um, times of intensive raking. Um, so in the in the late summer i, I give it a, a really good rake an area that i'm going to plant the following year and then leave it a month um, and give it another rake those roots and then a, and then a second uh, sorry a third rake about a month after that so it's it's fairly intensive um but i'm having really really good success rates um and then after planting i then go through in spring and put headphones on with some some loud music or listen to the birds and go through sort of like mr miyagi and just pick out the small bits of Travis Gantier. Um, I've planted a lot of forest sedges, um, largely um, Dissita and Vergata are both really good. Um, and they've really been effective for suppressing the, the Tradescantia to come back. And I think my main reflection over the, um, over the three years is, and I am an ecological engineer, I work with, with um, stream restoration and, uh, and stormwater management in my day job, but really observing what the hydrology is doing in the stream in Wellington. It's been really quite fascinating for me. Um, so like I said, there's only that pool there at the bottom that's permanently there. Um, but I'm really seeing the, the the way the stream flows, and at this time of the year, there's a there's a small trickle of water that's um that's permanently um, rolling down the uh, rolling down the catchment. And as we as we flip from a um, from a, an understory of I guess um, intensive um, tradescantia to an understory of leaf litter and uh, and and sedges and things, um, the the difference in that flow has been quite pronounced. So let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so there's just a couple of photos that you can see again um that's a pukatea that i planted um, in the middle of the tradescantia just before i started actually um and the photo on the right is is again the um the results and and down through there it's it's created a whole lot of sort of little forest wetlands i guess as it goes through so there's a whole lot of ranunculus and and gunnera and uh and isolepsis things yes, through there um if you go to the next slide um and this is this is looking up the stream this is actually a bit of an old photo if you were to to go there and i'd encourage you all to go there and, and take a bit of a look see behind the badminton hall this has actually grown up significantly from this but this is looking up the main stream channel that the previous one when i first started it was completely um unapparent that there was a stream even there it was completely covered in tradescantia so jump on to the next one um and that's just to show so so through the summer months the, the stream is dry and there's, there's obviously a lot of leaf litter that grows that that, that forms sorry and, and that's a really important source of uh of of uh, invertebrates or insects which which 
obviously get flushed down to the um, to the fish further on. But when it when it does rain, and if you go to the next slide, oh well, wow. it really pours. Um, so mm -hmm. so this was a this was a fairly large rainfall event. Um, and being a uh, being an ecological engineer, I'm a bit of a geek with water, so I do tend to <laughs> when it rains, I, I love to go in and, and see what's going on. And um, and yeah, it's been some quite dramatic flows. So the next slide. Um, and then this was further up the catchment. So I've sort of broken all the rules and I've started at the bottom and worked my way up, which normally when you do stream restoration, you need to start at the top and work, work your way down. But there's nothing wrong with breaking rules. Um, so this was last year's area. So this is looking down. If you go to the next slide. Yeah, that's that's looking down there now. So so recreated the, the, the stream through there and um, planted some kakadu. And so this is this is looking upstream. Next, just losing you every now and then, but we've got most of it. Um, do you want to just try summing up again, and we'll uh, and we can wrap it up there? Okay, yeah. So if you can hear me, um, it's been three years um, with plenty more to go. Um, around about, I think I've probably put in around about one hundred hours per year, and around about a thousand plants are getting planted every year. Um, and as I said, the stream is changing, the biodiversity and, and what is a, a small neglected gully is really thriving, which has been really cool to see. Cheers. Thanks, Stu, very much. Technology got on top of us a little bit there. Um, well, the lack of it probably, and we lost you in a couple of the bits, but we got most of it. So thank you very much for hanging in there, everybody. Um, and that was uh, Stu Farrant live from Auckland um, and with a bit of an issue with his phone. But we will just continue on. And Joachim, thanks very much for answering people's questions in the chat box. Hello, Nigel. Thanks very much. Um, you're not in a, a in a hotel in Auckland with a cell phone, are you? No, I'm looking out across Arrow Valley and Wellington uh, Central, actually. How lovely. Here's your. Um, can you tell us a bit about yourself first, and then take us through your presentation? Thanks, Nigel. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I split my time between IT consulting and uh, clearing old man's beard. Really. Um, I'm, I'm lucky to be able to do part-time and I've put more and more of my passion into clearing old man's beard across Wellington. Um, for those of you, if you, if you meet me for coffee, the, the don't look for a guy with a white beard. The, the photo <laughs> in the bottom right is my, is my on, online persona. And I, I have had people, you know, looking for the guy with a white beard. That one is actually old man's beard seed. There's, you know, a few thousand um, seeds in that beard. Um, and it, yeah, I left it on site and well, took, took some of it and put, put, put it in the waste as well. So yeah, Old Man's Beard Free Wellington, uh, we're species led rather than site led. So we're a volunteer organization. Um, most site led, you know, site led groups work within reserves and we started off in a reserve and then started spotting the Old Man's Beard, you know, neighbors on, on the road reserve, etc. So we've kind of spread out across Arrow Valley and now, you know, across Wellington in general. So I just want to start with a whakatauki, um, hei te tau ti toki. So this is really about, um, we don't know when something is going to occur next, so we don't know when uh, te toki is going to bloom. Um, it just blooms when it thinks the time is right, uh, not on a fixed schedule. Um, and with the same with Old Man's Beard, we don't have a fixed date in mind for being Old Man's Beard free. Um, we're getting out there, we're controlling it, we're, and you know we know we're making a difference. Um, this Titoki on the right side was from just below Mortimer Terrace in Brooklyn. It's one of the first sites we cleared and um, is coming back to life here. So it's really great that we've saved this mature Titoki from, from the Old Man's Beard. So why do we do it? Well, um, Old Man's Beard does spread like crazy. Um, on the left, we've got a spot in Devon Street Gully, um, Narkumikumi, and all the white stuff is Old Man's Beard flower and seed. Um, and it just really smothers the bush. It grows about 10 metres a year. It strangles and, and suffocates the trees. Um, the other two photos are just above Prince of Wales Park. Um, so we controlled this area last year, got rid of the old man's beard there. The one in the middle, again, is the Titoki. Um, it's almost dead, but you just see down the bottom there's some green leaves coming back, and it looks like we've saved it just in time. Mm. 
on the right, there's a Miro. Um, all the brown is the Miro dying off, but there are some green coming back. So we're definitely have a, having an impact on our, on our Nahiri and, you know, bringing some bits back to life. So that's what really gets us going. So what do we do? We, we you know, have some publicity and raise awareness of what Old Man's Beard is, um, the impact that it has. Uh, we do some advocacy, um, both with landlords, but also, you know, with council and getting more, more, more funding for weed control, etc. cetera. Uh, we go out and do training of groups and individuals. Um, on the right here, we had a session at Karori Sanctuary last, sorry, Karori Cemetery last year with both the um, Karori Cemetery volunteers and Karori Kaitiaki. And, um, you know, uh, the council provided Daryl Key to run some of the training there. We talked around old man's beard and other weeds and how to control them and then had a working bee for a couple of hours going around the cemetery clearing out the old man's beard. And we've done that with a number of groups, so we're happy to go along to your group or if you're an individual tackling old man's beard, we can come and, you know, show you some techniques. Uh, we've got a tool library. We run some working bees ourselves. Um, we do a bit of planting. Um, some of the sites that we've cleared over the year, we get out you know, about this time of year and start planting them out. And the next thing we're doing is, is uh, mapping the old man's beard. So we've worked with um, a, a number of groups up in Auckland who have developed this app. Uh, what we've been doing this year is doing a synchronization from iNaturalist. So we've got all of our data is already in our naturalist and we've been pulling it across into this um, GIS app. So we've now mapped the old man's beard all the way across Wellington. And then on the right hand side, you can see that as we go through and start controlling it, we mark up the dots to which ones have been controlled. And there's also a purple please check. So um, we, we go around and check, check those and then update the status of whether it's alive or dead. Given the seed bank of Old Man's Beard lasts for about 10 years, uh, we have to keep going back and checking. So we reset the status to purple each year, um, purple please check, and then our Old Man's Beard year kind of runs from August through till you know the end of next July sort of thing, uh, which corresponds with it... Um, Old man's beard is deciduous, so it dies off over winter, starts coming back about September, and then we start, you know, getting into our work, sort of October, November. So I um, hope you're all thinking, how can I help? Um, <laughs> we've, got, we've got a whole bunch of roles here, and 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 the roles you could take a number of them, but it'd be great if, firstly, if 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 you observe old man's beard, please enter it into our naturalist. Um, you can see here the, uh, uh, the vine on the left, it's got five leaves on the little stem coming out, and that's one of the telltale signs of, of old man's beard. Um, the other one is that the stem is, is ribbed um, or furrowed, going up vertically on that stem. And in the back there, you'll notice a bit of pink tape. So this is actually on a uh, trapping line. Um, so the, the trappers had to fight through the old man's beard to, to walk along the line. Um, Hank last night mentioned having a two for one of you know pest uh, pest plants and pest animals at the same time. So if you are going trapping and you, and you see some old man's beard, or if you're just in the bush or anywhere and you see old man's beard, please enter it into our naturalist, and that will come through to our map. Um, then we've got a new role which will be really sort of uh, going a bit harder on next next old man's beard year. So you know from when it comes back into um, leaf later this year is going through and visiting all the sites that have previously been spotted and updating the status of those. Um, that then gives us some great data on where we need to go to, um, to go and control it. We're, we're, we're looking at you know, potentially running some competitions for hunters this year as well and having, having some prizes at certain locations if you go and find the old man's beard there. Mm. The uh, next role is really sort of getting in there and actually doing the uh, the weed control. Um, we tend to use cut and paste. Um, so we cut the vine, leave it hanging in the tree, and then paste the roots. Um, this is one of the largest um, vines we found um, in Kiwifoot um, or Pukahina, 
between Arrow Valley and Kelburn. Um, you see it climbing up the tree in the middle, and then the right-hand side was about two weeks later. And we could see it from uh, from um, Kelburn Parade with all the uh, all the all the dead um, foliage and the, and the seed heads on there. And then the final, well, actually, no, not quite the final one. Um, another role is being a manager. Um, so you can, you know, take responsibility for an area. Um, I hope I'm not stealing Brian's thunder, but this is Houghton Bay where his group's been working and they've done a great job of, you know, managing that area, um, updating the map, you know, running a tool library, organising volunteers, etc. Then the final role we've got is sort of being a champion, so doing some advocacy, um, talking to neighbours and property owners, um, distributing leaflets so we've got some leaflets on the website you can uh, print off or we can we can send you printouts of those um, there's been some of these the, the um, Trilistic Park group have been putting some of these out around NIO recently then also submitting on the long-term plan uh, which is coming up soon so um, both for weed control or any any um, uh, restoration um, funding you think we should should be putting our, our rates towards So we've got a whole bunch of other skills that people have brought to the group. So um, one of our members, Ben, is a surveyor. He got hold of one of these spike GPS devices, which can uh, you can point it at a remote location and take a photo, and it measures the distance and the direction to that location and gives you the remote GPS coordinates. So we're, we're working on building that into our workflow so we can get a more exact location of where the old man's beard is. Um, we've got a volunteer has done some work on machine learning. Um, that's stalled a bit. So if anyone's got any great skills in that area, we'd love to hear from you. Um, the, the photo, the white bits in the photo are Old Man's Beard in Flower. Um, this is from the City Council aerial images of 2021. So they're taken around sort of January, February. So any, any plants that were in flower, then we can detect those. Um, then Noem has done some great work with weaving baskets out of old man's beard. Um, so we, we're keen to run some workshops uh, where we maybe go and collect some old man's beard in the morning um, and then get out, um, have some lunch and then make baskets in the afternoon. And then finally, with the map side, uh, if you've got any GIS skills, especially any kind of front end development, we're looking at um, creating an a even better interface for updating these weeds. Uh, so we'd love to hear from you on that as well. So for more um, advice or, or details, there's our website, omb3.nz. Um, we've got a bunch of links there for the map, so anyone can access the map. Um, so if you do enter something into our naturalist, we sync it hourly. Um, it should come through and you should see then see it appear on the map. Um, we've got a bunch of social media links. Uh, the first two are really our public side, and then the final one is our community volunteer group, um, if you want to get involved in our working bees. And there's an email address, uh, at omb3.nz. So we'd love to hear from you. Just before you go, thank you. That was fantastic, uh, Nigel. Tremendous um, presentation. Um, and it's great. To, you talk a lot about uh, jobs for volunteers, et cetera. Um, is it is it quite? Do you have quite a social volunteer group? Do you get together quite regularly? Yeah, we sort of in the peak season we get together mostly Sunday mornings. We did do some after work sessions uh, this year with with the uh, with the group actually from the Boys and Girls Institute and McDonald Crescent. They they had a patch above the terrace tunnel. And we we spent a few evenings clearing that. Um, and, you know, volunteers um, come and go and, and uh, yeah, it, it really is quite social. And so it, it's social, you know, you, you, you get a good workout without going to the gym. You're out in nature and, you know, you're doing good for the environment. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I've brought uh, Alona back in too and uh, we've also got Brian Walters who has joined us. Thank you, Brian. Um, but there's a question here that one of you might be speaking either to or could help with, and it's um, a bit of a query on Cape Ivy, um, and I think it was uh, just your thoughts on Cape Ivy. Um, have you got any um, any advice for people? 
Um, my neighbour's actually got Cape Ivy with old man's beard growing underneath it. You have to dig down about six layers of Cape Ivy um, to get to to then chase the root along. It's, it's a real pain in the in the butt. Um, I tend to just pull it myself. Um, I've, I've cleared a few banks that way, but I don't know. My loaner might have some other thoughts or plan. Um, it all depends on whether or not you want to use chemicals, really. Um, it grows from tiny little fragments like most gorgeous weeds um, and things. So you can hand pull small plants um, uh, or use um, a stump treatment like um, Nigel did. Um, but you need to kind of make sure it lifts off the ground so it, um, it can't sort of just resettle and reshoot, unfortunately. It's one of those gorgeous ones. <laughs> Yeah, they were mentioning it. We did a webinar last night. They were mentioning it in the Miramar Peninsula that where Cape Ivy was, uh, there seemed to be a, a, a spike in rat populations. Yeah. So it was uh, it got us all talking about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, you guys. Thanks very much, Nigel. You're a gem. Um, thanks so much. Lovely to have you part of the webinar. And um, I'm going to put you in the green room, and it seems that people have questions and they want to put, Nigel, what about this? Uh, then you can answer it in the chat box. And that seems to be working really well. Thanks to everybody who's doing that. Nigel, I'll send you away. Thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, and Alona, I'm just also going to do the same with you. How lovely. Um, there you go. <laughs> and uh, Brian, welcome. And I'm, I'm, I wasn't going to mention it, but you have not been well with the flu or bug and um oh alone is back um you've not been well but you're still here that's what i love you're here to help us so um please uh, take it away i'll put your um presentation on the screen um kayaku iti kayaku matrahi o ngā mata waka o te motu tēnā rā koutou katoa uh, me mihi ki atika ki ngā mana whenua uh, ko te ati awa ko ngāti toa rangatira uh, ka mihi ki ngā māngai kōrero, uh, ko um, Yoakum, ko Stu, ko Nigel, nā koutou i uh, whaka uh, oho oho i aho, i roto tēnei kaupapa whaka hira hira. Um, ko Brian Walters, taku ingoa. <clears throat> so this is an outline uh, for the purpose of this talk. Uh, so these are the subjects that I'll touch on. Um, so, Kei Hiati Takiwa, where is it situated? Uh, ko Wai Tato, um, who our group are. Um, ko Mato Tikanga, our practices. Um, a definition of weeds, an overview of weeds, and a case study uh, for a, uh, a focus on karo. So, uh, yep, to the east there is. Um, uh, Hue Te Para, so Te Rai Kaiho is a 22 hectare reserve on the rugged uh, south coast of Te Whanganui Atara between Hue Te Para, Lyle Bay and Haiwai, Houghton Bay. So one pepeha that we researched was Ko Te Tini o Te Pekeha ki Te Moana ko Ngāti Ira ki Uta which translates to as abundant as the broad-billed prion are at sea, Ngāti Ira are as, as abundant on land. And as this whakatoki suggests, Te Raikaiho, the headland that eats the wind, has been a place of connection for many centuries. Over this time, there have been several changes of indigenous and non-indigenous peoples, plants and animals living and interconnecting on the south coast headland. Archaeological sites provide evidence of pre-European occupation. The area was cleared for a dairy farm in the 19th century. Due to the efforts of a visionary group of people in the 1980s, Te Raikaiho is now established as a Wellington City Council Reserve and over the years has had several different groups and individuals caring for the headland, planting, weeding and keeping the tracks clear. So ko, ko Waitato, um, Te Ohu o Te Raikaiho is a group that helps to provide the connections between the community and our key partners. Um, our vision, 
um, is to restore the indigenous connections, both living and non-living, of Te Rai Kaiho over the next 800 years. Our mission is for the restora restoration of Te Rai Kaiho and the connection of Moana, Ngahere, people and communities. So, our mahi is guided by tikanga. We're doing a lot, which is as represented by this list of four activities in the slides. But for this presentation, I'm going to focus on pest plant control. It is our wish to connect people. Um, and one way we can do this is encourage people to forage their food. It's creating connections and giving mana to the whenua. And it is this des desire to connect and honor the land which leads to certain outcomes and informs our actions. For example, working in an, or in an organic fashion. At this stage, I just want to um, acknowledge the many groups that we've um, uh, connected with over the last few years. Um, I'd also just would like to acknowledge um, Rawiri um, Rawiri's korero, I'm not sure if he's attending from the first um, webinar, um, how he referenced the Modi Tuhono framework. Um, and one thing that I thought he, that was relevant from his talk uh, was to give te taiao, and in this case plants, um, their opportunities, the, the opportunity to reach their full potential. Mm -hmm. So a brief discussion on, on weeds. A weed can be any species that grows where it is not meant to. That doesn't just mean unwanted plants in cultivation land. It can be a plant that causes problems in a landscape like gorse or blackberry. But, they, the, that, but that may be where Māori understandings differ. The Oxford Dictionary defines a weed as a wild plant growing where, where it is not wanted and in comp competition with cultivated plants. It is a very anthro centric way of looking at the world, which the dic dictionary defines as regarding humankind as the central of most important element of existence. From a Māori perspective, it could be said that a weed is a plant that upsets the balance that Papatua Nuku needs to be well. That suggests that a weed is a plant that dominates an ecosystem to the extent that it is no longer able to function in a way that enables it to sustain the life that belongs there. A weed is a plant that disrupts that natural balance. One, um, one, uh, one way we look at um, this is through the plant karaka, um, which we view under the domain, we have chosen to view under the domain of rongo matane instead of homie tiki which, which is, um, you know, that and, and the cultivated plants or uncult uncultivated plants. And that, um, leads to how we um, we control the plant. So a description of the key pest plant species. We have native plants that are not native to Wellington, i.e. Karo, Hohere, the Northern Lacebark, Pohutukawa, Karaka, and also a number of Pseudopanax hybrids. Um, Nigel um, has been very supportive. And what we really like about um, Nigel's work is it's a very effective way um, of controlling weeds. Uh, so this picture, which he showed earlier, but just goes into a bit more detail. Green basically means we've got it under control. Um, orange, we're on top of it. Oh, sorry, green means the plant's dead. Orange, we're on top of it. And the red are our priorities for next season, and which is in a very steep um, terrain. We also have the, the usual uh, regulars, Cape Ivy, English Ivy, Japanese Honeysuckle, and Aliagnus. Just before I move to the final um, part of the talk, um, we probably have the worst infestation of Wellington of evergreen buckthorn. If you live in a uh, windy, uh, salt-prone and sandy area and you don't know evergreen buckthorn, definitely look it up. Um, and yeah, even though we don't have a lot of green dots there, we are on top of it. And um, we had just started working in the last month on the worst infestation on the eastern slopes. So it's a rather unique case with karo. Uh, so we have a method where we set up vegetation plots, which is a five by five meter plot, 
and monitor the growth of the forest um, in these clearings that um, we've created. Uh, we apply four treatments uh, um, along, we, we have an, um, control sites and then we apply four treatments, which is both planted, non-planted, weeded and not weeded, and with some very interesting findings. Uh, we found that the clearing was a bit invasive and created a bit of a mess. So we've, um, we've now started working with ring barking, um, which is a much slower approach. Um, and this is just a really great photo that shows how um, the, the plant really isn't letting any um, light through to the sub canopy due to the thick leaf of um, Pittosporum, Pittosporum crassifolium. And um, yeah, we are now moving from on average, you could five, find five to six native plants that, um, in the reserve to up to 40 to 60 species that um, would have naturally been found historically. Anyway, thank you very much um, and, and great to be involved. Thank you so much, Brian. I, that was a brilliant presentation, and I, I hope you're feeling better very soon. You're a, you're a legend. That was great. Um, Henk, um, it, it, amazing speakers, uh, you know, amazing presenters, and uh, um, I've brought you in now just to maybe thank them on behalf of, uh, of the council. Oh, yes, thanks very much. Uh, uh, to be honest, uh, Phil, I, I have lots to learn, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, tonight was fantastic and just a couple of takeaways you know that giving to tire that opportunity to grow uh to its full potential and uh you know weeds being a labor of love i'll remember that and i'll i'll look for some labor of love that i can go do with my kids around uh here in porirua where i'm uh where i live um and then i, I i'm just it's really great to hear that there's there's a lot of ways that you can connect in it's not just about pulling out plants or um or doing the hard yards but you can bring your your skills from across different sectors and um, you know like build, building that technology um, and really giving opportunity to make things more effective and more e and easier to uh, to come across so um yeah it's it's really just encouraging to hear that uh, there's so many facets so many opportunities uh, for people to connect uh, to volunteer uh, programs yeah exactly thank you Brian I'll let you head away now so you can have a nice hot um, lemon drink or something see you later Bye bye, bye bye. What a uh, what, yeah, what an amazing guy that guy is. You know, just under the weather and still comes and is part of our webinar, which is great. Um, Alona, same with you, I suppose. Um, I, I just thought it was good to give you an opportunity to, um, if there's anything you, you want to say before we wrap up. I I just think that I I hope that everyone really appreciates all of the um, amazing work that has gone on here and and how you can tackle weeds in a different way. Um, and they all have different facets to that, which I think is really, really, really exciting. And what I like to see is how we can then kind of snowball some of that mahi um, and, do, um, and do other things. Like Nigel's work, he's worked with people um, in Auckland Council um, and just um, the, the ability to find those networks is, is super exciting for me because... Um, and sharing them is even better. Like um, Joachim's work on Tomoto Kaidangi is really, really exciting. Similarly, what we're learning about Cape Ivy, thanks to the rat nests that they're creating, <laughs> it's really exciting. And that work that um, that work Stu had done by just on his own bat by during the lockdown period. I mean, how amazing! What a transformation! I, and what I love is being a Wellingtonian going behind the badminton hall for the first time and seeing this incredible <laughs> incredible yeah. gully that he that he's um he's worked on um yeah i'm always so gobsmacked by the the amount of work um that our volunteers do yeah yeah just lovely just lovely um alona thank you very much for your time we've just got to do we wrap up and i um i thank you for your brilliant work and being part of this series for us well, thank you very much, Nick, as well. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Brian, Nigel, Joachim, Stu, Alona, um, Hink, and, of course, Bryony and myself um, uh, are the team for tonight. And we hope to catch you tomorrow at the same time, 7 o'clock, for the webinar that Hink was just mentioning. And then there's two to go. So, yes, tell others to join us, and we'll see you then. Brilliant tonight. Uh, keep warm, everybody. See you later on. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night.